think AI is an amazing tool for affecting the world, uh, but I got to leave it somewhere in the five range because ultimately it takes people, it's human problems that need human solutions. But as a tool, there is, whether we're talking about deep neural networks as they exist right now or next generation technologies coming out, um, there are problems that are not otherwise tackleable at scale without AI. Well, and we'll come back to this more. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually giving you guys an unfair uh, request of putting it on one scale because it's probably two. But uh, Jeremy, where do you come out on that scale? Mm. Some people, some parts of the world, minus 10. Some parts of the world, some people, plus 10. Um, in fact, the person you introduced me to, Marshall Brain, wrote a great book okay. about this called Manor, showing how both, both results can happen in the same world. So it's interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll quote my dear friend Neil Jacobstein, who is, uh, uh, we'll be hearing from. Neil talk, says, it's not uh, artificial intelligence I'm worried about. It's human stupidity. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, particularly human yeah. group stu stupidity. It, it, Human group stupidity. Human group stupidity. Particularly when they're angry, stressed, and, and in, in difficult situations. So I want to come back to this a little bit more, but uh, let me take a second, and I'd love you in a capsule each to talk about uh, what are you, how are you using AI. So let's uh, begin. Uh, you're, at Berkeley, you're at Berkeley now. Tell us about your company and what you're doing. Uh, yeah, so um, again, I, I started my life as a theoretical neuroscientist, uh, which is really where the deep neural networks emerged out of uh, from our field. Um, but about 10 years ago, I became an entrepreneur and started thinking about how I could take what I knew about brains and about machine learning and affect the world. And it may sound crazy and wildly overambitious, but I would distill down what I do across many different companies is I want to very literally make better people. So uh, my core company, Socos, is focused in education, uh, but very different than most people might think of it. Uh, in line with some of your last slides, it's education whose purpose is to produce happy, healthy, productive lives. It doesn't, the specifics, factorizing a polynomial or knowing some particular fact about the world that's important, it is are we producing people that are meaningfully impacting the world. Um, but I do personal work in uh, health technology, uh, inventing uh, treatments, cures, detectors. Uh, I do work in really rethinking hard uh, things like human capital. Uh, you know, I think both of us would probably agree that one of the biggest open questions about AI is how it's going to affect things like the future of work, uh, about professional and, and non-professional work. And these are huge open questions, and I get to be a mad scientist and just look and see how AI as augmentative intelligence really can play a role in that space. And just to drill down one second, uh, for Socos, uh, uh, your product there, are you? So in our, with our product at Socos, um, our, our core product is essentially a multi-AI driven system, uh, a quick narrative. Pick my daughter from school, she's got so many pictures she's drawn that they all just very quickly end up in the compost bin. Um, so we built a little AI, it analyzes that. I CC her grandmother and at the same time it comes to Muse, what we call it, and we get an analysis of her artwork. It analyzes my son's uh, speech patterns when he talks to me. Uh, we combine that with a whole bunch of top-down knowledge about the things we know are predictive of life outcomes. Comes out of a very rich literature. Love to tell everyone about it. And from that, we, the worst thing we could do is say, here is what the crystal ball says about the life outcomes of your three-year-old. Uh, as soon as you provide that, that profile, you've ruined everything. Positive or negative, bad outcomes. So instead, we do something very simple, and we can do it all via SMS. We simply provide an activity every night for the parent to do with their kids. Uh, the promise that it's the best way you're going to spend 20 minutes with them every night. So I, I can go and sign up for Socos? You can go sign up. Uh, we, most of our accounts we give away philanthropically. Uh, we always appreciate it for the parents that uh, sign up for the full app version because you pay for all, everyone uh, in the rest of the world. I'll be in South Africa twice in coming weeks, hoping to develop new programs there in the townships. So when you can deliver, take a fancy AI, but put a front end that's just an SMS, you can reach the people that actually need these interventions uh, as long as you're pairing with people on the ground. Thank you. Jeremy, um, I've watched you through a few incarnations. Uh, the company I met you with, Kaggle, was recently acquired by Google, uh, where you were present. Actually, you were, you were sort of like the, uh, if you guys know Kaggle, it was a sort of 
group of smart AI experts that would compete against each other. Over to, half a million. Yeah, mm -hmm. to, to solve problems. And Jeremy was like the, like the top performer out of half a million. And then Kaggle sort of reached in and pulled him out and made him president of Kaggle. But what's happened since? Um, I, um, well, actually, uh, Will mentioned the idea uh, right at the start of this conference of using AI to diagnose disease. So I actually created the company that kind of invented that. Uh, it's called Analytic. Um, the focus is at the moment on radiological data. Right. Uh, the idea is that there's a shortage of about 10x to 20x the number of doctors we need in the world. It's going to take, according to the World Economic Forum, 300 years to fill that gap through training. So we're trying to <laughs> fill that gap through AI. Yeah. So not replacing the doctors, but make them vastly more productive. Uh, as I built that company, uh, I realized that the basic techniques we were using, Vivian mentioned uh, deep neural networks, which is really what this is all about, um, can be used for everything from um, disaster resilience to improving education to improving crop yields. And uh, I kind of you know, also know this through my SU work, that there's all these grand challenges which we can help with this technology. So since that time, I've also built a company which is trying to educate everybody, you know, I mean everybody, um, so that they can go back to their organizations and use this technology to help whatever they're doing, whether it be counting cars and satellite images to make bundles of money in a hedge fund through to improving crop yields in India. I don't care. So we've had over 100,000 people now go through this course uh, of all walks of life, and they're applying so this, this is to, an, to help uh, So the, the name of your company is called? Fast.ai. It's a good name. And anybody can go and do the course for free. And like literally, people have gone through the course with, you know, who only started coding two years ago. There's one now who's a Google Brain resident. Uh, if you've seen Silicon Valley, the TV show, that Not Hot Dog app was built by one of our students. Uh, lots of amazing stuff. So stories. how many people have gone through Fast.ai? Uh, uh, over 100,000. Great. Amazing. And so uh, am, I, am I, as an outside user, looking at Fast.ai to educate myself and my employees, or am I looking at it as a pool of people I can hire out of? The, the former. Um, and the former. I, I really think that it's better to educate you and your employees um, because you understand the problems you're solving. You know, you shouldn't be hiring in external vendors or relying on external software or hiring in some machine learning PhD. Much better to get the people in your organization who understand your strategy, your constraints, your data, and uh, upskill them. That's, that's our strong belief. And, and what's the experience? Is it uh, many video courses? Is it yeah, it's an online course uh, with uh, these amazing uh, interactive notebooks where you basically become an experimenter in AI. You, you type stuff in and you see results and you learn through um, trying things out. And, and neural nets or, or machine learning? Yeah, neural nets, which is a type of machine yes, learning, as you know. Um, but neural nets specifically are the thing which is causing machine learning now to go exponential. Yes. Um, that wasn't happening before. We were held back by some limitations, of technical limitations of the algorithms. Um, actually, neural nets turn out to not only have no limitations, but they scale exponentially with data and computation. Yeah. So I want to echo the idea of having people do this internally, because I think one of the real limitations right now with AI isn't on the technical side. I mean, there are some fundamental limitations there, but we're not really pushing those boundaries. It's really in the infrastructure, which includes how people are implementing it inside their companies. And if you don't really understand what's possible, then uh, there was a Sloan paper that just came out recently saying, listen, you know, largely, you're just doing this very easy optimization, let's say resource planning optimization or ad targeting, when there are huge new opportunities uh, existing inside your companies, you just aren't seeing them because you're thinking, how is this just a classic tool? It's like a really smart spreadsheet, and it's just going to solve my existing problems faster and, and better, when really you need to think, well, how can this completely restructure my company uh, where I don't have people pulling a bunch of levers. I have people solving problems about the unknown, leveraging this sort of tool set. Right, exactly. And to Vivian's point, I think it's, it's um, you know, my analogy here would be like the internet squared, right? So if you were selling shoes in the 80s and 90s and you heard about the internet, you'd be like, uh, shoes, internet, probably not relevant. And now Zappos have come along and eaten your lunch and Amazon's eating every retailer's lunch. The impact of deep learning to organizations is going to be much, much greater and much, much wider. 
Um, so not only do you need to understand the capabilities, but also the limitations. So for example, people are increasingly looking to use machine learning and even neural networks for things like predictive policing and in the justice system. It turns out that the data that they're training these things on is terribly biased due to all kinds of social and historical situations, at least in the US. And as a result, it's quite possible for people to end up um, creating AI-based systems which embed the bias that lives inside people. So there are huge issues, which is why it's really important, you know, again, to Vivian's point, to, to understand the technology so that you can use it but not misuse it. How many folks here have actually done any kind of AI machine learning related coding? Can you raise your hand? So it's relatively a small number, probably 1%. How long does it take for a person to go through your course? Uh, it takes seven weeks, um, but in the new version... And how, gonna... how, how much time each week are you putting in? Well, uh, uh, let me answer a slightly different question, because in the new version we're going to be having uh, releasing in the end of October. Uh, it'll be two lines of code to create a state-of-the-art image recognition system. So the full end-to-end -end thing will take you about 70 hours, but within the first 20 minutes, you'll know how to create a literally a custom state-of-the-art image classification tool. So I'm curious, how many folks here would be open to investing uh, 10 hours a week for seven weeks? Yeah, or at least 20 minutes. 20 minutes a day? Tw at least 20 minutes to get started, or up to so, 70 hours to become who, an who has an appetite for that in the room here, just to get a sense? So, um, I well, mean, you know I, where to come. Fast.ai. You know yeah, fast.ai. Yeah. There you go. It's free. A free, mar free marketing pitch for there a free product. But I, I think if you, if you think about this in the context, the goal here isn't for you to be writing production code yeah. of complex AI systems. It's rather, think of what the, maybe the future of medicine could be. So I developed a system that was mentioned earlier that predicts my son's blood glucose levels about an hour into the future. I developed another that predicts manic episodes and bipolar sufferers weeks into the future. In both of those cases, it doesn't replace endocrinologists and, and neuropsychologists, but of course, it totally transforms what their jobs might be. They yeah. need to understand where systems like this might actually fail, where they would need to intervene, um, but at the same time, it phenomenally empowers them into becoming some hybrid of a medical doctor and a data scientist, uh, and really then their job becomes the human side, a, per a truly personalized uh, medical plan, which just is not how it gets handled right but, now. But these like incredibly advanced algorithms, like although until recently they've taken hundreds or thousands of lines of code to produce, and it's more likely you'll screw it up than get it right, because there's so many details to get right, it is getting a lot easier, you know? And as I say, we've got it down to two lines of code now, and I think it looks a lot like Anybody who used the internet in the early 90s or remember editing pp2t.com files and setting up slip and like you had to be an expert and write all this code to connect to the internet. Now, you know, I think deep learning and AI is going to become more like, you know, a mobile phone internet connection. It'll just be something that we use everywhere. One, one of the things that was interesting is I came when I was in China uh, just uh, two weeks ago with my, uh, my A360 community. I was uh, meeting with uh, a number of entrepreneurs. There's probably more AI-related startups coming out of China than any place on the planet. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things was uh, uh, Kai-Fu Lee, who uh, is one of the investors in, my, in, my, in Planetary Resources that you'll hear about later, and uh, was the president of Google China before it got shut down, has been investing in, uh, in chipsets, I kid you not, that are basically $5 chipsets to enable anything to have machine learning capability on it. So that we're heading towards a world in the near future where everything has some level of AI. I mean, every kid's toy will learn. Yeah, it looks like the next Apple iPhone, based on some leaks, seems likely to have an AI custom processor embedded in it. And uh, Apple's also recently released some libraries that allow Google's TensorFlow AI system to be built into Apple iPhone apps. So that's happening very quickly. So what, is that, what, is that, will that, what will that look like when everything starts to be AI enabled? Just you know, extrapolate on the words, if you yeah, would. Yeah, so I, you know, Google's making some interesting progress on this also with what it calls federated learning. So imagine with these sorts of chips built into your phones, it does all of this deep neural network learning there and then only transmit the models back. So it's not necessarily sharing all of your personal data. But I think thinking about a smartphone or a smart car or even smart light bulbs, 
while interesting, is not really seeing the big picture of where we're taking this, which is um, really thinking about all of these devices as a big distributed robot exploring the space. So if I'm Google or Apple or Tencent or Baidu, I'm not thinking about owning a platform with a whole bunch of devices on it. I'm thinking about a single entity that's exploring the world, that gets to every one of them is a separate sensor. Uh, now we're back to AI eating the world. Good. Well, yeah. we're, we're sort of getting there. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want to overplay what's capable. So don't think that this is, I'm describing an intelligent thing on, in our sense. But I am talking about a very explicit and intentional system that if you are simply thinking, what can this sensor collect on this phone and report it back to me for analytics, as opposed to an active, what is called a reinforcement learning model, for example, that's actively probing the world and trying to learn. And every one of you then become part of this sensor system. Actually, we're, we're, we're building something very much like that. I'm uh, helping build a company called Doc.ai. Actually, we're it's partnering it's called with Doc.ai. Do it's partnering with Deloitte, actually. Yeah. And uh, we're actually um, shortly to release a uh, blockchain-based system for doing just what you say with medical data, where you can join up with other parents whose kids have illnesses like yours, share your medical data um, in an encrypted way through the blockchain. And then that uh, can then be accompanied with a uh, offer of a reward to data scientists to solve that. And so it's all done on the edge devices. On the, on the phones uh, is basically where your medical data is held. Mm -hmm. And so we're teaming up with uh, a number of big medical organizations to have make it possible for their patients to suck their data into their phones and then through this blockchain system connect it to everybody else who has similar medical issues and then use these kind of edge devices in, in that way. It's, it's really cool. I mean, it's, it's exciting. I have to say when I did this with my son, I had to hack all of his devices and it turned out break several federal laws in doing it. Um, which I understand. I wouldn't want it to be easy for people to hack medical devices. but. He essentially is a cyborg now. He's got live, intelligent devices all over to him. And what makes it really exciting is, with the system we built, they essentially communicate with one another. So this is something that's also different than a traditional platform play. Is there's no black box server this stuff all has to go to. Because they have local processing capacity, and they're exchanging information in their own little mesh network, then suddenly, this, this little thing, which is my son, is smarter. It, it's smart unto itself. Um, when you combine other families, uh, and there are a number of different plays in specific illness groups we we're talking about, or in education, uh, you know, what truly works best for a kid like this right now who has these strengths and these weaknesses? Right. I mean, imagine, for example, your, your kid has an illness at an early stage. Another family has contributed data from the same illness a year later after some intervention enough of this, and you can actually figure out what intervention is going to work for, for you or for your family member. Now, the one thing about it, though, is particularly in a world like this, it'd be really easy to think that the right intervention is the one we learned in the Bay Area. And then you take that to some kid in Nairobi, and it fails miserably for a hundred different reasons, because it's a different people in a different place, uh, and you have essentially inherited the bias without realizing it. I think that can be true, although, you know, with deep neural networks, as long as you've collected the right data, you should be able if to you've identify collected, I'm not saying it's a fundamental problem, it's yeah. a human problem. Yeah. So let me take you back to three news items the past two weeks, uh, making sort of uh, uh, sensational headline news, uh, the, and I'll ask you for comments. Uh, first is, uh, Facebook shuts down AI because it learned its own language. Um, uh, okay, uh, second one is, uh, you know, uh, OpenAI's uh, system beats top uh, Dota 2 uh, video game players. Uh, and, uh, and third one is, AI is more risky than North Korean uh, nuclear war. Uh, so, um, so, in order? Uh, uh, yeah, please. Bullshit, kind of bullshit, bullshit. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, wow, I, lovely. I'd love to add some what nuance else to, to this, <laughs> but it's bullshit. It is <laughs> astonished, particularly that first one oh about God. the chat So box. Can, we, can we just, can we, so I wanted to hit this for you because 
uh, as, as, uh, as an SU uh, representative, you, in one sense, are representatives out there to the world. And there is such a level of amygdala uh, ignited uh, hype about AI. Uh, and we fear that which we don't understand. Can, can I give you four names? Please. Uh, there are only four people I'm aware of you should listen to who write about AI. So I'm going to tell you who they are. Okay. Uh, one is um, uh, Dave Gershgorn, who writes for Quartz. One is Mariah Yao, who writes for Forbes and Topbots. One is Jack Clark, who recently joined OpenAI uh, and has a great newsletter. Uh, and then Tom Samanite at Wired. Those four did not, not only did they not echo that bullshit article, but they all quickly wrote corrections. So the problem is most journalists have no, no ability to spot the bullshit, um, but here are four people who, who can, so follow them. But when you look at some of the, I mean, there are some modestly successful AI companies out there whose whole strategy is to auto-generate fake stories to sway people's political opinions. Uh, now, if that's a profitable business, I wouldn't be surprised if just writing the, I mean, just writing the headlines to grab your attention is, is also a really profitable business. Uh, and it's not surprising then that they took this route, but it is... I saw the headline just, you know, Vivian Ming has a uh, cyborg son that just came out. Yes, uh, of course. It's... More dangerous than North Korea. Yes. Um, <laughs> my son is Skynet. Uh, and... Um, but you I know, he'd find that fun, though. But, you know, the thing is, like, you don't hear their attractions, right? So yeah. Peter mentioned this Dota thing. So for those of you who don't know, Dota is, like, the biggest computer game in the world, or one of them, multi-million dollar prize money, and uh, OpenAI, which is this overhyped, over-monetized <laughs> research lab, did a pretty cool piece of research where they created this very, very, very specific bot that played this particular version of this particular game in a particular way with a number of particular kind of cheats, um, and beat somebody good, um, and suddenly that was in the news, and Elon Musk, you know, blah, blah, blah. The next day, uh, 50 people beat it. Now, nobody wrote about the 50 people that beat it, let alone the fact it was in this incredibly limited Never, never heard that part. Never yeah. heard that. So that's, no. you know, what you hear I, I about just, AI. I just, the point I want to make is that uh, AI is extraordinarily powerful. It's going to transform every aspect of our lives. It's something we need to be aware of. If you're not incorporating some version of AI into your company, um, you're not going to survive in the long run because you're not going to compete in the long run. But at the same time, it's understanding the appropriate, where to appropriately use it and not to create a fear-mongering about it. I think either direction, sort of techno-utopian vision that if you just add enough processing power, human problems just magically disappear. Human problems take humans to solve them. AI is just an amazing tool to augment that power. Um, I, I will also add a little bit of additional nuance. With regard to the Facebook story, the vast majority of machine learning models that have ever been trained have been thrown away because they don't do what you want them to do. These fucking things. You work <laughs> for months to get them to work right, and they don't and you scream at the command prompt, and you get rid of them because it turns out they're incredibly fragile and nuanced uh, creatures. Uh, the most robust problems are the easiest to solve. So, uh, so in this case, it isn't shocking that in the course of trying to train up a bunch of bots, and let's speed up the training process because there's a shortage of data, we'll have them talk to each other. Uh, right now, to, they were trying to get it to speak English, and it failed to speak English. So they went, oh, we screwed it up, and they stopped. Exactly. So yeah. you flush it because it didn't do what you want to do, not because it was about to get the launch codes. Uh, <laughs> and, but here's another slightly nuanced one. I will admit this is purely this sort of inventor's arrogance thing here. One of the things that annoys me most about the Dota story was the first headline I read about it. Elon Musk's AI beats world's best players. And I got to <laughs> say, if everyone that worked on that model read that headline and thought, I don't remember Elon being there working on this, you know, <laughs> till three in the morning every night. Uh, you know, it's nice when the funders, and I mean, same thing when I hear DARPA invents or any of this stuff. In fact, a, a woman invented that at OpenAI, and she is not out there crying about it. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, there's a lot, it is hard work making these things actually do 
anything useful. Once they're able to, they can have truly amazing impacts on things. But I think it, it's appro appropriate to appreciate their limitations, but um, also to, I, I don't know why the fear mongering is the, the thing that is really scratching this sort of itch in our nucleus accumbens, this kind of reward signal here. Uh, it, but, but why you... we should be any more afraid of an AI in the hands of two current world leaders, or sorry, atomic weapons in the hands of two current world leaders that are, are duking it out in words versus an AI doing it. Once I, one of my companies, we actually predicted who people should hire. Uh, recruiters give you five seconds. They look at your name, your school, and your last job. Um, our system looked at 55,000 variables based on 122 million people. And a reporter at the New York Times said, well, would you, which would you prefer for your kids? And I said, M my system isn't meant to hire people. It's meant to augment recruiters. But if I had to choose, I would choose mine. As that first pass versus all of the known bias in the original system. Um, but, so, you did, but you did mention a very real threat earlier, which we should be scared about, which is the future of jobs one. Like, mm -hmm. okay, killer robots isn't happening, uh, at least not for a long time, but killer people might well. And like, we do now have very direct evidence that the automation of industries is, is destroying jobs and they are not coming back. Yep. Um, and like, people say, like, oh, well, with all these AI things, surely you're going to need lots of data scientists. No, I, I am very much in the process of building automatic data scientists. We, yeah. we don't need lots of data scientists either. We don't need lots of people to manage the automatic truck fleets, you know, maybe one per 10 to 100 trucks. So as these jobs disappear, it, it should be abundance, right? It should be great. Only if we find ways to allocate resources in a way that's not based on labor or capital inputs. And th this. This could destroy and you, us. And you and I have had this conversation. Those of you who follow my work, I, you know, I write about this prolifically that it's not the Terminator sequence and AI and robotics I'm concerned about. It is the near-term loss of jobs. It's not even the loss of jobs. We, we can predict which jobs we're going to lose. We cannot predict which jobs we're going to create, number one. Number two, it's the rate of job loss that is the issue. And so when I talk about you know, building a bridge to abundance, it's how do we, how do we uh, properly think about and span the next 20 years? Right. Because it's this period of time. So I'm actually partnering with Tony Robbins. Uh, and every January at A360, we're doing a half-day program on, we're calling it Bridge to Abundance, the Future of Work. Uh, and I know SU through Gary Bowles are going to be doing a lot of work on this. Because I think it's one of, the, one of the signature issues of our day that every one of us need to be thinking about and understanding uh, how do we deal with that, because it's going to be very real, and there's going to be a public outcry. I, I call it, you know, people, people fire bombing the Google buses because they want to get their anger at somebody for taking their well, job. Well, we, we're already seeing the tip of the iceberg of what anger-driven politics looks like. You know, when people get scared and they get displaced and they don't feel able to do anything about it, they get angry, and there are 300 million guns in this country, largely held by the people who are going to get the most angry. So like, this is a very real issue. It's not, can you imagine the utopia where we don't have to work and we can do whatever we like? Um, Peter's already done that for us, but I don't think any of us believe that we've figured out the, this, the no, bridge It's, it's, the, to it's get the bridge there. to get there, yeah. Yeah, so I, so I have a, a book coming out called How to Robot Proof Your Kids. Uh, so, say again? How to Robot Proof Your Kids. And, uh, it's and it's really in three sections. One is a discussion of what AI is in the practical terms of how it will impact us. And the other is the problem statement of what happens, right? We have to completely rethink how we think about education and jobs. I don't mean what skills should kids know now or how do we reskill a factory worker. That's, that's not even the right way to think about this at all. We need different people. Gallup estimates there's maybe 130 million people worldwide that are actually engaged with their work. They find meaning and value in it. They care about it. Uh, now, I'm, it's wrong to think that AI takes jobs. It's much more that it does specific tasks. But as those tasks get automated, there are a lot of jobs out there that might be easier to hire a lab tech for instead of a doctor. 
uh, to hire essentially just a pair of legs and an arm to walk an AI around a room uh, rather than a professional. And that's going to have profound impacts. If you're not above that line where you are doing engaged, uh, as I say frequently, sort of creative uh, problem solving, then I don't really need you that much. Not as a professional, not as a, I need decision makers. I need problem identifiers. I don't need people doing rote work. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, 130 million people may sound like a lot, but in the global scheme of things, that's a rounding error. Great, great points. So uh, 30 seconds to close each. Uh, Jeremy? I think that the, the, the main thing I want to focus on is what you guys can and should do about it. Um, although behind the, I mean, in fact, behind the scenes, these algorithms aren't that complex. They are a bit fastidious to get right, but we're in the process of you know, optimizing and automating that. But for you guys to use it in your organizations, in your jobs, if you're in government, to use it in policy, it's not that hard. You know? And if, if you don't actually engage with learning this now, you're going to be like the folks who ignored the internet until it was too late. I mean, or worse. You, you, you taught me this, Jeremy. I mean, you, Jeremy sat down one day and spent a day with me, uh, I don't know, some part of a decade ago, going through and teaching me about the basics. And it's like every one of you have extraordinary amount of data. Companies don't realize what you have as assets. Your assets, you know, include your cash, your customers, your, uh, your, uh, and ultimately what people don't realize is your data is an amazing asset you have. Right, and, and but, but so many people think, oh, we'll just outsource it to some big vendor. And you can't outsource such a fundamental piece of strategy. Like think about Google, right? Google are basically a data products company. Can you imagine if they were outsourcing data strategy they wouldn't exist. Yeah. So you need to upskill yourselves and upskill your people and believe in your people. AI skills are not born on trees. They're developed in as little as but it's also it's a, it's a way of thinking. Absolutely. It's a way of we can figure out in that data what's the algorithm, what's the gold right. mine so that our company... So you've got to hire and promote and retain people based on their ability to understand data, not yeah. just on their ability to understand your domain. Vivian, a 30-second quip, and then I want to go to Q&A. Yeah, I, I will try to cut it even less than that. I, I, I strongly agree, but I would say to nuance it even further, um, it's that knowledge base that you have about your business and your problem space. Uh, that you can't currently, at least, outsource that to an AI, even if you wanted to, and you certainly don't want to outsource it uh, to a big player. So. You, you need to bring something to bear on these problems. I have yet to start a company in which I didn't show up feeling phenomenally ignorant. Instead of applying neural networks from day one, I spent months and months learning everything I could about the market and the problem space. Yes. You're already experts. Mm -hmm. Don't sell that out to companies that already want to eat your lunch. Yeah, you are an expert in, in some problem. And it's that expertise in that problem that differentiates you. Um, OK, so if we can bring the lights up a little bit. And, uh, and we have mic runners. We have mics. What do we have? Hi, Peter. Mark Donahue uh, from Abundance. Uh, Good to see you. Good to see you, too. I had a question about uh, where you're seeing really innovative models of human interaction with what I call, and Peter does, intelligence assistance versus AI. So instead of replacing the human, how do we accelerate them and make them merge with technology to the greatest potential? Yeah, so, so many examples. I'll throw out one which Jeremy knows about. My company, Human Longevity, right? We look at full body MRIs and it just takes, you know, it, most of the imaging, 99.9% .9 is normal and you're looking for that 0.1%. What you really want to do is have the AI look at and find the issues and then have the human look at the, you know, the 1% or sub 1%. So medicine, a lot of that is medicine. That's also how Inlytic works, in, uh, exactly right. that way. And also we're uh, shortly going to be releasing a beta of another company called Platform.ai, which is specifically designed to... you got a lot of good .ai names. Yeah, yeah, I uh, invested well in them. Um, basically, it's, it's a platform to allow humans to kind of 
interact with the machine learning algorithm in a way that the machine learning algorithm tells, it, tells them what it needs to know, and the human tells the machine learning algorithm what, it, what they can provide, and you try to get this kind of optimal so that's combination. that's one example. I'm sure there are many so others. I'm pushing into the true uh, far end of this. My lone remaining areas of purely academic research are neuroprosthetics, particularly cognitive neuroprosthetics. Uh, and so literally increasing people's working memory span, uh, I have a company in New York that is working on something that very few others are, which is synchronous team with uh, EEG and other neuroindicators, where we're actively looking at the indicators of trust, uh, flow, of flow psychological states. safety, of communication quality, so that we can short circuit uh, the amount of time it takes a diverse team to become a high performance team. So like getting a, a group into flow together? Yes, exactly. But, awesome. uh, and really leveraging that, one of the co-founders was the head of DARPA for their uh, neural feedback sniper training program. Awesome, next question, who's got the microphone? Hello. Hi. Hi, Peter. Stand this up. Is, yeah, I'm right here. Okay, gotcha. Hi, my name is Kostikas Paho. I'm not Greek. I'm from Albania. I came uh, like your father 20 years ago with my family. Uh, I have a question I've been dying to ask you. It's a, it's a two-part question. So, if uh, our cells, right, they always replicate and information goes from cell to cell, it's a form of a copy in consciousness. So, if consciousness is copied to artificial intelligence, isn't that the same at the end of the day? Uh, isn't it still consciousness, whether it's a machine, a robot? Isn't it like a human transcending into that? And it doesn't really matter what happens to us eventually. And then the second one is <laughs> if we could have a matrix-like world simulation where you can tell the difference between the real world and that, and you can bring anyone in there that you want, would you guys accept that? Um, so, to the first question. Can, can, uh, I get the, can I get the lights up in the audience so I can see? Yeah, so to the first question, um, I think the starting point is, and I say this with some recognition of the research in the field, nobody has actually invented artificial general intelligence. A lot of people researching it. It is not a thing that exists in the world. And we have no reason to believe it's about to be. Yeah, I, I, I genuinely don't think it will grow directly out of deep neural networks, for example. It's the wrong sort of technology concept for this. So the questions of, I love the science fiction sort of idea of thinking and preparing for a world in which we might need to make decisions about that. But uh, I think it's better for us to focus on what the technology is now. There is a massive untapped spread of that technology. Um, so it, it's truly fascinating ideas. But it's not, I don't want anyone to mistake that artificial general intelligence is a thing and that in the near future it will do any of the things we might imagine. All it is right now is a distraction from the bigger societal issues Vivian's talking about, I think. Thank you. Next question. We're on the verge of quantum computing. How is that going to affect AI? And how do you see the future of AI based on the quantum computing coming up? Ah. Is it convergent in any way? Or so forward? quantum computing. Yeah, um, no one really knows. Um, the, uh, the, the current quantum computers that kind of exist aren't quantum computers at all. The ones from D-Wave do something basically called simulated annealing really quickly. We don't know at all that they can do anything faster than computers or that they ever will. Uh, there are some companies that are working on true quantum computers, but on the whole, the ability of quantum computers to speed things up in general is massively over-promised. Uh, we actually don't have any reason to believe that they're going to make a huge difference to things like deep learning algorithms. They might. Uh, but at this stage, uh, we, there's, there's certainly no reason to assume that. I think there might be a sort of a metaphorical angle here, which is people think quantum acuity, computing, and maybe that has some additional, almost magical element that it adds into it. Really, the whole deal here is how long does it take to train a model? Right. When I did my dissertation, it took me a month to get in trivial models to converge. Now you can do these amazingly complex systems relatively fast on GPUs and big scale systems. That 
may not sound like much, but it's a transformation. If you get to test new ideas in the market over the course of a couple of hours of thinking about a problem, instead of waiting months for a single model to converge and give you its, its output, totally transforms the kind of market right. you There's a lot of hardware improvements around, but this one that's commonly said that if you add one qubit, you double the amount of computing performance, it actually turns out for various technical reasons that's not remotely true. Uh, so got to be a bit so, careful So I'll just, that. I'll repeat what um, my friend Chad Rigetti, I don't know if you know, if you know Chad at Rigetti Computing, I had him on stage with me last year at, at A360 talking about computational power, in particular at quantum computing, and he, is, he does believe that, uh, that he's building what is a, I agree with you, D-Wave is not a true quantum computer, but what he is building right now, he believes is a real quantum computer, and he does believe it will have uh, immediate implications for machine learning. So I guess the question is, we'll, we'll, we'll find out the projection either from Google or IBM or Rigetti Computing or whatever's going on in China, yeah. which is not There's actually known. another company that's doing something with accelerating deep learning algorithms by using uh, optical directly. So rather than having like um, silicon chips with electricity going through, it's literally speed of light optical stuff and it does it using basically photonics. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of interesting areas going on. It'd be interesting to see which one But wins. the thing that's interesting to close the session out on is I hope you're taking away from this. There's so much going on. And a lot of these things are influencing each other. And one, one tipping point in one area you know, it may be that, that uh, deep neural networks enable us to design a better quantum computer, and then that quantum computer enables to... So it's, it's the uncertainty and it's the multitude of things that are converging in unexpected ways over this next decade that make it really an amazing time to be alive. Please welcome and thank Vivian and Jeremy. Whew.